Good afternoon and welcome to Google's Los Angeles office in beautiful Venice, California. Happy Tau Day, everyone. I'm Michael Hartle, founder of Tau Day and author of the Tau Manifesto. Today's talk is about the circle constant. That is to say, the number that relates the circumference of a circle to its linear dimension. Now, I'm being intentionally ambiguous there when I say linear dimension, because the traditional choice for that dimension is the diameter. But that's not the only choice, as we'll see. If you make this choice, you can characterize the geometry of a circle by dividing the circumference by the diameter, yielding the traditional circle constant, pi. Pi was famously approximated by Archimedes of Syracuse uh, in modern notation. C over D is uh, approximately equal to uh, 3.14159, and so on. But there's something fishy about pi. Pi writes the circumference divided by the diameter, which gives primacy to the width of the circle. But in fact, there are infinitely many shapes that have constant diameter. There's only one shape that has constant radius. A circle is the set of all points a particular distance, the radius, away from the center. And this suggests the possibility that perhaps a more natural choice for the circle constant is C over R. Quick calculation shows the relationship between the two. Pi is equal to C over D, which is equal to C over 2R. And this factor of 2, as we'll see, haunts us throughout science, engineering, and mathematics. Multiply, multiply through by that 2, and you get that C over R is equal to 2 pi. If you look back at the original approximation by Archimedes, he actually uh, calculated or bounds for both C over D and C over R. In modern notation, C over R is 6.28 through 185, and so on. So in 2010, I proposed a notation for C over R. I uh, proposed using the Greek letter tau. And this was in an effort to popularize what I believe is the true circle constant in opposition to pi. So at this point, I would like to acknowledge that we are up against a powerful enemy. <laughs> All of us have been exposed to an enormous lifetime dose of pro-pi propaganda. I mean, people write books about pi. Like there are whole books about pi. Right? I mean, people write books about pi. A few years ago, a little internet startup uh, called Google even changed their logo in honor of so-called Pi Day. 3.14 in the American way of writing dates. In case you're wondering, this was the final straw. It was, when, it was the Google Doodle on Pi Day in 2010. I thought, all right, enough is enough. So people, they, they form a real emotional attachment to Pi. They connect to it. They memorize hundreds, even thousands of its digits. I mean, I know it might seem crazy even to, to memorize uh, 50 decimal places of Pi. Like, who would even do that? 3.14159265358979323846264338327953991693993750 It's a terrible terrible thing. So even though we're we're up against a powerful enemy, we do have a powerful ally. Because the truth is on our side. So let's take a look at some common expressions in mathematics and see if we can see any patterns. So this is the normal distribution. This is the, the density for a, a bell curve. So you can see there's a 2 pi there. The details here aren't important. Just look at the patterns. Fourier transform, important in many areas of science and mathematics. It's a 2 pi there. Cauchy's integral formula in complex analysis. It's a 2 pi. Gauss-Binet formula in uh, differential geometry. Uh, the so-called nth roots of unity is a 2 pi. This is one of my favorite sums. It's the sum of the inverse squares, 1 plus a fourth plus a ninth plus a sixteenth, and so on. In summation notation, we can write that as the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared. Uh, this actually has a closed form solution. Anyone happen to know it? Yeah, this is pi squared over 6. So like, that's a pi, right? 
Well, it turns out that this is true uh, for the a second power. It's also true for a fourth power. There's a closed form solution, pi to the fourth over 90, which might lead you to suspect that anytime there's an even exponent there, that uh, there is a closed form solution. And that's true. It can be written in terms of the Riemann zeta function. Again, don't worry about the details. I just like to draw your attention to this factor of 2 pi. <laughs> so even in this case where it seems like pi is just by itself, in fact, there's a, a missing factor of 2. Yeah, so I'd like to explain some of the origins of, of this project. And it begins with a mathematician named Bob Pillay. Yeah, in 2001, Bob Pillay published an article called Pi is Wrong in the Mathematical Intelligencer. And now, of course, he didn't mean that pi is literally wrong. It still has all the qualities uh, and characteristics ascribed to it by mathematicians. It's uh, irrational and indeed transcendental. Um, but the, the point of pi is wrong is that pi is an unnatural choice because of this factor of two that we saw. And uh, pi is wrong introduces this idea of c over r being one turn, because as we'll see, it represents one turn of a circle. And so at this point, I'd, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that uh, Bob is actually here in the audience. He, he came out for this talk and to meet me and other uh, Tao, enthusi uh, Tao enthusiasts. So if we could give him a, just a brief round of applause for his work in starting this thing. So, so pi is wrong planted the seed for what became the Tao Manifesto. And I noticed that people were citing it on places like Reddit and Hacker News, uh, the kinds of places that uh, computer, math, and science geeks hang out on the internet. But it wasn't really going anywhere. It hadn't, it hadn't turned into anything, and it hadn't turned into a movement. So in 2010, I set out to hack geek culture. I thought, all right, I'm going to introduce this notation, something that's immediately pronounceable, that's easy to typeset, and then has kind of a visual resemblance uh, to pi, right? It looks like pi, but missing a leg. It was also influenced by uh, the choice of describing this as a turn. Uh, in, uh, the English word turn is based on the Greek word tornos, which means lay. Then you can see there's a factor, of, or there's a tau right there at the beginning of the word. Um, so uh, armed with, with this, uh, this idea, this, this new notation, tau equals 2 pi numerically, I realized that we also needed a focus for the movement, something that would bring everyone together. And so it's amazing how long it took me to figure out the answer that was obviously correct in retrospect, which was to take Pi Day, which happens on 314, and launch a new holiday called Tau Day on June 28th. So on June 28th, 2010, I launched the original Tau Manifesto. And it immediately struck a chord. So I took some screenshots that day. Uh, someone tweeted out, hooray for Tau, this breathes new life into my trigonometry. <laughs> That sound, it's my mind blowing. <laughs> Childhood suspicions confirmed. The circle constant is broken. Switching to tau immediately. <laughs> this guy really got into it. Do not circles deserve first class quadratic recognition? Let us throw off the yoke of ignorant pi oppression. <laughs> so I knew I was onto something when the next day I got a bunch of messages like this. Oh no, I missed tau day. <laughs> so over the course of the next year, other people uh, picked it up and ran with it. And so at that point, I, I really knew that, that, uh, this, that something was going on. So Michael Blake uh, composed an amazing piece called What Tau Sounds Like. I have nothing to do with that. He just did that on his own. It's got over 600,000 views as of now on, on YouTube. Uh, on uh, the, the first Pi Day after the launch of the Town Manifesto, uh, the amazing Vi Hart released a video. If you haven't seen her videos, they're just incredible. Um, she made a video called Pi is Still Wrong. And it's got over two and a half million views on YouTube uh, as of right now. Of course, I don't really these days call it Pi Day. I call it Half Tau Day. <laughs> uh, so this started to take off. And it, it started to infiltrate geek culture in the way that I hoped it might. Um, so for example, MIT changed the time of day they announced admissions. It used to be just on Pi Day. Now it's on Pi Day at Tau time. <laughs> Uh, Tau made it into uh, the iconic geek comic strip XKCD, regarding Pi versus Tau as a proposed compromise to the Pi-Tau dispute. Um, not to be outdone, the, another iconic geek comic strip, Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial, or SNBC, uh, made this comic. The father says, hey, little monkey, can you tell daddy how many fingers is this many fingers? Two finger. Later. So uh, my two-year-old calculated the pi tau conversion constant. <laughs> uh, it's, it's made it into textbooks. There's a college trigonometry textbook that uh, uses tau. And I've uh, 
gotten lots of feedback from teachers uh, in high school and, and, uh, and other levels as well, saying that they've used Tau with uh, great success. It's also made it into some uh, computer programming languages. Uh, most recently, a, a, a little niche language some of you may have heard of uh, here at Google called Python. So as of Python 3.6 from Math Import Tau, and there we are. I'm sure many people here also know that uh, there's a calculator at Google. Uh, if, you, if you drop pi into it, it'll evaluate it as 3.14159 and so on. But in fact, this isn't pi, this is Tau over two. So I want to find out who is responsible for this and buy that person a beer. <laughs> Speaking of which, Tau has also spread to areas that aren't strictly a science and math. A couple years ago, Hawkshead Brewery in the UK in Crooked State collaborate, collaborated on a sour beer called uh, Key Lime Pie on each side, but they said, you know, there are two of them, so we should call it a Key Lime Tau. Uh, any guesses what the alcohol percentage in this beer is? <laughs> That's right, 6.28%. <laughs> but of course, you can't take on an icon like Pi without expecting some conflict and a resistance. So there has been some pushback on the choice of notation. So let's start with that, the Greek letter tau. And there are some legitimate concerns here, but I'd like to, uh, to mention a couple of important figures who have emerged since the original Tau Manifesto got published. Now, one is a physicist in Europe named Peter Harmus, and uh, he reached out to Bob Pillay around the same time that I told Bob that I was planning to publish the Tau Manifesto, proposing that we use Tau for C over R. So it's completely independent of me. And I later found out that Joseph Lindenberg wrote a math essay in 1990 or so on mathematical constants. And it was obvious to him that C over R was the right circle constant, and, but he needed a symbol for it. So at the time, he was restricted to the Roman alphabet and the Greek alphabet. So he looked through, he thought, well, which, which letter feels most like a circle constant and has, uh, like, sort of minimizes the number of conflicts? Which is the least bad choice? And he came up with Tau as well. In fact, Joseph now maintains a website called Tau before it was cool. <laughs> but there, there are real conflicts. Uh, so for example, in, in rotational mechanics, Tau is used for torque. Uh, in relativity, it's used for proper time. Um, I found out after I published the manifesto that it's also used for the golden ratio, one plus the square root of five over two. Now, this is the kind of thing that, yes, there are some conflicts. There are only so many letters. But it's also something that you can route around. Uh, so for example, one of my favorite textbooks, uh, Introduction to Electrodynamics by David Griffiths, uses n for torque. Not to route around a conflict, just that's the letter he uses. Uh, for proper time, maybe you could throw on a subscript. Um, the golden ratio has a standard alternate. It's probably even more common. You can use the letter phi. But it's also interesting to note that uh, the use of tau for the golden ratio shows that there is precedent for using this letter to represent a fundamental mathematical constant. So even though there are these conflicts, I, and, and you can maybe route around them, I think a, a lot of scientists, engineers, and mathematicians underestimate their ability to handle ambiguous notation. So I want to show you an example um, drawn from quantum mechanics. Don't worry about the details here. You can just look at the high-level patterns. Um, this is uh, A0, the Bohr radius. By the way, note that that's the Bohr radius, not the Bohr diameter. And it's a, a combination of fundamental constants, uh, h bar squared over m e squared. h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, that's right. m is the mass on an electron, and e is its charge. Um, now, so this represents roughly the, the radius of a hydrogen atom in its ground state, its lowest energy state. And in order to analyze this from the perspective of quantum mechanics, you, uh, you introduce uh, what's called the wave function, psi naught. And that's proportional to e to the minus r over a naught. And so again, it, this just describes the, uh, the system mathematically. And this, what this says is that it decays uh, exponentially uh, with, a, uh, with a length scale set by the Bohr radius. Right, so this, if you've never seen this before, you might think, I don't know, understand what's going on here. If you've seen this before, you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. But there's something you haven't noticed, which is the point. This e and this e are not the same e. The first one is the charge on an electron, and the second one is the exponential number, the base of natural logarithms. In fact, if you expand out this a naught, you get e to something with e in it. All right, so I guarantee if you said, oh, let's use e for a mathematical constant, people would say, oh, no, you can't do that because it's already used for the charge on an electron. But in practice, nobody really has any trouble with this. So that's all I'm going to say about the notation. Uh, the rest of this talk is about the math, and of course, there has, there has been some pushback on that. The Pi Manifesto appeared in 2011. Uh, 
There's a full rebuttal to the Pi Manifesto in an updated version of the Tau Manifesto, which you can check out. But the rest of this talk, we're going to discuss uh, the mathematics behind Tau. And in order to, to do that, uh, I want to refer, uh, return to first principles by taking a fresh look at circles and angles. So you may recall from uh, high school trigonometry these, uh, these special angles written in degrees. So zero degrees, 30 degrees, 45, 60 degrees, 90 degrees for a right angle, and then 120, 180, 270, and then back 360. But as you may know, degrees are in fact not the preferred way of measuring angles in mathematics. Instead, mathematicians prefer to use a system called radians. So in radian angle measure, what you do is you observe that the ratio of the arc length, s, to the, the radius is constant for all the concentric circles. And so you can define an angle theta as that ratio, s over r. So I'm going I'm to show what those special angles look like. You recognize them in degrees. We'll get, come back to this, but I just want to kind of shock you back into high school trigonometry. These are the angles written in terms of pi, what I call pi radians. If you're like me, you memorize these in, uh, in high school trigonometry. But if you think about what these angles really are, what makes them special, well, they're just particularly simple fractions of a full circle. So for example, the 30 degree angle here is a 12th of the circle. 45 degrees is an eighth. Right? A right angle is just a quarter. Here's a third. And finally, all the way around the full circle. So that suggests writing the arc length as uh, in terms of the fraction of the full circumference of the circle. So for a 30 degree angle, be, that fraction would be a 12th. For a right angle, it's a fourth, and so on. So if, if we then plug in to the definition of radian angle measure, we can see that theta is equal to s over r, but s is fc. So that's fc over r. We can factor, factor out that fraction as the fraction times this dimensionless constant, c over r. But of course, that's just tau. So if you are a believer in pi, I fear that the resulting diagram of special angles will shake your faith to its very core. <laughs> because this tw one twelfth of the way around is just tau over 12. <laughs> An eighth is tau over eight. And so on around the rest of the circle. Finally arriving back at one turn equals one tau. <laughs> So to me, this is just a one diagram proof that tau is the right circle constant. There's, just, there's no way around it. And if you compare it to the diagram with pi, you can see what's going on here. What's happening here is, for example, at a right angle, that's a 2 pi divided by 4, but that cancels. The 2s cancel, and we get pi over 2. So we have a quarter of something is equal to a half of pi. And that's really confusing. And indeed, I think that this confusing factor of 2 is probably part of the reason why Degrees are still the most common way of talking about angles, that uh, radians have never really taken root outside of these narrow contexts. And I think this is probably why. So I think if, we, if you look at this series of diagrams, I'm oh, sorry, so, so this, it, 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 conversely, if we look at this here, we see that uh, tower four is just a quarter turn. Right? It's, it has a transparent uh, geometric meaning, but it's also just a number, right? 6.28 divided by four, 1.57. So we get all of the, uh, the concrete benefits of radians while still having this transparent uh, abstract meaning. So I think if you, if you look at this series of diagrams through the eye of a beginner, you can see that using pi instead of tau is a pedagogical disaster. <laughs> Confusing, it's unnatural. This is why pi is wrong. So at this point, uh, more mathematically sophisticated people are, are going scrambling through their heads like, oh, what are some other things? Like, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, what about Euler's identity? So if you've, if you've heard of this before, you've, you might already have thought of it, and if you haven't, well, you're about to get an introduction. Um, so to, to talk about Euler's identity, I want to discuss the, uh, first the, the uh, circle functions. So let's look at it, what's called a unit circle. So it's ra unit, uh, radius equals one, and there's a point here on the circle with an angle theta from the horizontal, and there's an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. And in terms of uh, what, are, what they call the circle functions, this is cosine and sine. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. So that point it has x-coordinate cosine theta and y-coordinate sine theta. 
Now, Leonard Euler proved an important uh, formula, an important theorem um, based on these circle functions, um, relating complex exponentiation to uh, cosine and sine. Now, Euler was one of the great mathematicians of all time. And so uh, you, you can bet that if something is called Euler's formula, it must be pretty important because he proved a lot of formulas. So here it is. E to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. So this relates complex exponentiation to the circle functions. So, and in order to get what I believe deserves the, or the, the name and what, what captures the true spirit of Euler's identity, we're going to evaluate this formula when theta is equal to the circle constant, which is tau. So e to the i tau equals cosine tau plus i sine tau. If we look at our unit circle, when theta equals tau all the way around, cosine theta is, uh, is one, or cosine tau here is one, and sine tau is zero. So that gives us this equation. e to the i tau equals one. And using the, the idea, or the, the name that mathematicians use for one when they want to think of it, not just as a number, but as, as the, uh, the abstract idea, we can say this is the, that the complex exponential of the circle constant is unity. So it's a fundamental relationship uh, between these constants. And indeed, there's a geometric interpretation uh, if you look in the complex plane and have the, the real part of the, number, of the complex number z on the x-axis and the imaginary part on the y-axis, and then rotate it through an angle theta, that rotated point is the same as um, multiplying by e to the i theta. So e to the i theta geometrically corresponds to a rotation by an angle theta in the complex plane. And so that means we can interpret this geometrically as a rotation by one turn is one. So in other words, if you rotate by a full turn, you just get back to where you started, and that's the same thing as multiplying by one, which does nothing. So I, I submit that this is at least a candidate for the most beautiful equation in mathematics, which brings me to what I think is not the most beautiful equation, <laughs> which is Euler's formula evaluated when theta equals pi. So again, looking at our unit circle, when theta equals halfway around the circle, Cosine pi is negative one, sine pi is zero, and we get e to the i pi equals negative one. But there's something fishy about this formula. What's going on with this negative sign? It's so ugly. In fact, this is almost always rearranged immediately to form e to the i pi plus one equals zero, at which point the expositor usually uh, says something mystical like, ooh, this, uh, this formula connects the five most important numbers in mathematics, 0, 1, i, e, and pi. But is this really the most beautiful equation in mathematics? I mean, I don't know. There's a negative sign. We had to rearrange it. What's really going on here? Well, we can find out by rewriting the Euler's identity traditional form in terms of tau. It's e to the i tau over 2 equals negative 1. No rearrangement. What's going on here? Well, what's going on here is that it's a rotation by tau over 2. So here's a point in the complex plane, a plus ib. x coordinate a, y coordinate b. And if we rotate it around half a turn, we get this point at negative a and negative b. So that's just negative a minus ib. We could factor out the negative 1 to get negative 1 times a plus ib, but that's just negative 1 times z. So in other words, what this equation is telling us is that a rotation by half a turn in the complex plane is the same as multiplying by negative 1. So the original form of Euler's identity has a transparent geometric meaning that's obscured when we write it in terms of pi. So I believe this, this really ought to be called Euler's identity. Um, People do have a tendency to get all numerological about it, though. And it's amazing how many people complain that this formula relates only four numbers. So in this context, I would like to note that e to the i tau equals 1 plus 0. <laughs> so I, I assert that this equation actually does uh, <laughs> unite all of the, most, uh, the five most important numbers in mathematics, 0, 1, i, e, and tau. <laughs> So if uh, you arrived here as a pi believer, surely by now you must be questioning your faith. Is there no iconic, famous equation that has just a pi by itself? Can anyone think of one? What's a famous equation that just has a pi? Pi r squared. 
pi r squared, it's true, the area of a circle. So that is just a pi by itself. Circular area would seem to, uh, to present a challenge to the, the tau worldview. Should I be worried? I don't feel worried. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at circular area and see how it's related to tau. So here's the equation, a equals pi r squared. It's a very famous iconic formula. But there's something fishy about this formula. <laughs> What's fishy about it? Why the sudden love for the radius? I thought circles were about their diameters. We're dividing out by d. So we really should write this in order to be consistent as a equals 1 quarter pi d squared, which isn't nearly as pretty. All right, so let's figure out what's really going on here. Let's look at this, this expression. I want to draw your attention here to the power of 2. Uh, that second power makes this a particularly simple quadratic form. That's what the name mathematicians use for this kind of expression. Uh, now, uh, I want to show you some examples of the kind of patterns that quadratic forms follow. And for this, I'm going to draw on my background in theoretical physics. I have a PhD from Caltech. And when I was a graduate student, I taught the physics core curriculum for five years. Uh, and I'd like to show you some examples of quadratic forms that arise in the elementary physics curriculum. Um, it's not necessary to understand all the details here. Just uh, look for the high-level patterns. We're going to start with a, a calculation for the distance an object falls in a particular amount of time. So a Galileo Galilei found that the velocity of a, a, a dropped object is proportional to the time it's fallen. So if it falls twice as long, it goes twice as fast. The constant of proportionality is the gravitational acceleration, g. And in this context, the velocity can be defined as the time rate of change of the height, dy dt. So we can find uh, the distance fallen by integrating uh, v dt, which is the integral of g t dt, but g is just a constant. We can pull it out. Integral of t is t squared over 2, so y is equal to 1 half g t squared. We can also look at the potential energy in a spring, another common thing that shows up in the elementary physics curriculum. Uh, Robert Hooke showed that the force uh, that a spring exerts to restore to equilibrium is proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. And uh, the constant proportionality is essentially a measure of the stiffness of the spring, is uh, the spring constant k. And the potential energy is uh, equal to the work done by the spring force as you uh, compress it or stretch it. u is equal to integral of f dx, integrate, integrate the force over the distance. So we say u equals f dx, integral of f dx equals integral from 0 up to the final displacement of kx dx, which is equal to 1 half kx squared. And finally, I want to show you the calculation for the kinetic energy, one of the most important quantities in mechanics. Um, Isaac Newton found that the force is proportional to the acceleration. The constant of proportionality is the inertial mass, m. This is the most famous expression of Newton's second law of motion, f equals ma. Now, the kinetic energy is equal to the amount of work done accelerating a, a mass, m, up to a final velocity, v. So that's the integral of the force over the displacement again. So k is equal to integral of f dx, but the force is mass times acceleration. Acceleration is the time rate of change of velocity, m dv dt. Uh, now, Newton would be unhappy at this point because we're using the no notation of his hated rival, Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz. But one of the great things about Leibniz notation is that you can manipulate these little differentials, these d's, as if they were fractions. So we can write dv dt dx as m dx dt dv. We can just swap the dx and the dv. But this here is just the velocity. So this is the integral from 0 up to the final velocity of mv dv, or 1 half mv squared. So just to review, distance fallen, potential energy in a spring, kinetic energy. You may by now have a sense of foreboding as we return to the geometry of the circle. <laughs> Let's calculate the area of a circular disk. We can do that by breaking the disk into rings of uh, length equal to the circumference of that radius and thickness equal um, to uh, dr. So the area is circumference times the thickness of that, of that ring. Now, the circumference is proportional to the radius. The constant of proportionality is tau. We can calculate the area of the circle by integrating over all the rings. So a is equal to integral of dA equals the integral of cdr which is the integral from 0 up to the final radius of tau r dr, which is 1 half tau r squared. 
<laughs> Indeed, uh, in the original proof by Archimedes of Syracuse, he showed not that the area was pi r squared. Archimedes didn't have modern algebraic notation. What Archimedes proved was that the area of a circle is the same as the area of a right triangle with height equal to the radius and base equal to the circumference. We can then apply the formula for the area of a triangle, area equals 1 half base times height, as a equals 1 half bh equals 1 half cr equals 1 half tau r squared. There's simply no avoiding that factor of a half. All right, I've been doing this a while, so uh, as you might imagine, I've fielded a lot of questions over the years, so this is just a few of the most frequently asked questions. One question people ask is, well, won't tau confuse students? Like, they already know about pi. This is, it's like, this is too complicated. So in this context, I'd like to show you a tau testimonial. I'm sorry, Shirley, I mean a tau testimonial. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just want to give you the background here. There was a student who at the time was an undergraduate at MIT uh, was uh, trying to help his sister, who was in high school, with an upcoming trigonometry exam, and she was really struggling. So he was showing her everything the, the standard way and finally said, no, no, screw this. I'm going to do this the correct way, and he switched to using tau. And she grokked it, using the term grok from... Uh, Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land to indicate that she really understood it. When the test came, her strategy for the test was to do every problem with the tau circle and then to sweep over it at the end and convert every tau to 2 pi. She was the first one in her class to finish the test with 100%. So, in fact, tau is much less confusing than pi. I also think it's worth noting that the idea that pi might be wrong is interesting. So this is a way of hooking people into uh, having an interest in a subject that some people might consider a little dry. Another objection that people raise is to say, well, isn't it too late to switch? I mean, okay, yeah, like I kind of get it, but I mean, wouldn't all, you just have to rewrite all the textbooks? And, and the answer is no. We just saw that you can make a change incrementally. You can, like, you can always substitute tau and 2 pi for each other mechanically. Um, so uh, there, there's, a, there's really no, no need to uh, you know, to make the change all at once. If you're trying to redefine what pi means, then it would be hopeless, but this can be an incremental change over time. And as we saw, there's already a textbook that uses it. So the second to last question is alarmingly common, and uh, so I'll, I'll allow Natalie Portman to ask it on behalf of uh, everyone else. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. No, I'm not a crazy person. Apart from my unusual shirt, I'm, um, practically normal in every way. You would never guess from looking at me on any other day that I'm uh, anything other than a normal person. You'd never guess that I'm in fact a notorious mathematical propagandist. But I think when people ask this question, what they really mean is like, this isn't like your full-time thing, right? You're not like a full-time Tau activist. Like, no, I do other stuff. I'm actually the author of a best-selling book on web development called the Ruby on Rails tutorial. Uh, there's an overlapping audience for these two products, for the Tau Manifesto and, and the Rails tutorial. So every once in a while, someone will, will tweet out saying, oh my god, I just realized that the author of the Tau Manifesto is the same as the author of the Rails tutorial. Like, what? They're a little slightly different in tone, as you might imagine. Um, and this is, has now become part of uh, my current venture, which is uh, an educational products company called uh, Learn Enough to be Dangerous at learnenough.com. So this is not my full-time gig. I do other stuff. All okay, right, the final question is it's important. It seems lighthearted, but I really feel like it, it captures something essential for any sort of movement like this. But what about puns? Right? Pie is fun. It's like pie in the sky, pie around. We have this, this tasty dessert. And this was actually one of the things about Tao that I was really pleased about when I, I realized, you know what? There's a lot of potential here for making puns. And if you're going to try to insert this into geek culture, that matters. So, for example, we can see here is, here is the Tao. We're all Taoists. So what I've done here is I've taken the traditional symbol of Taoism, the, the yin-yang symbol, and rotated it. How, how far? I've rotated it a quarter turn, or Tao, or four radians. So, so what is this? Is this pi? This is, this is yang. This is, this is only halfway around. We have to go all the way around to understand the true nature of the Tao. Right? We need yin, too. So using pi instead of tau is like having yang without yin. And we can relate this to Euler's identity by noticing that e to the i tau equals 1 says, be one with the tau. 
A rotation by one turn is one may sound like a tautology, but in fact, it is the true nature of the tau. <laughs> Finally, even as we contemplate tau's mystical implications, we must remember that Taoism is based on reason, not on faith. Taoists are never pious. <laughs> So I, I hope you'll join me in, in celebrating the true circle constant, uh, C over R, and I hope you'll also join me in calling it tau. Um, I'd like to leave you with some, some words of wisdom, some words that have a great, uh, a great deep and personal meaning to me, and I hope they'll have a meaning for you as well. Those words are 6.283185307. Six seven six six five five nine zero zero five seven six eight three nine four three three eight five zero two one one six. Thank you.